Our uh, this year's uh, speaker is Dr. Moses uh, Ochono, who is coming from Vanderbilt University, uh, Tennessee. He is the Cornelius Vanderbilt Chair in History and Professor of African History. He has published five books, four of which are single authored and one edited volume. He has to his credit over 30 scholarly articles published in reputable journals, more than a dozen book chapters. Uh, Dr. Chano's books include Emias in London, Subaltern Travel, and Nigeria's Modernity, published by Indiana University Press. Another book is Africa in Fragments, Essays on Nigeria, Africa, and Global Africanity. Then the third book, Colonialism by Proxy, Hausa Imperial Agents, and Middle Belt Consciousness in Nigeria. Then his first book, Colonial Meltdown, Northern Nigeria, in the Great Depression, published by Ohio University Press. The detailed volume is titled Entrepreneurship in African History, published by Indiana University Press in 2018. Dr. Chong knows uh, op-eds and essays have been published in Time Magazine, Maple Tree Literary Supplement, the Chronicle of Higher Education, Logos, Global Post, The, Tennessee, the Tennessean, Pambazooka.com, African Arguments, The Conversation, The Mail, and Guardian, among others. Dr. Chono is a two-time recipient of the American Council of Learned Societies uh, Fellowships, and his research has also benefited or been funded by the NEH, Ford Foundation, uh, Rockefeller Foundation, the British Library, and the Harry Frank Guggenheim Foundation. What a, an amazing uh, record of scholarship. I hope you help me to welcome Dr. Ochano to the podium. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, incredibly generous uh, introduction, Professor Chuku. Um, good evening, everyone. Good evening. Yes. It is an honor uh, to be here on the campus of UMBC. It is a lovely campus. I wish uh, I didn't have to go back to Tennessee. <laughs> <laughs> I see, uh, you know, I'd like to recognize a few people, Professor Chuku, who orchestrated this whole thing. <laughs> so please, uh, thank you. Um, I, don't know, I don't know if she's here, Danielle Hunter, who's uh, the administrator in Africana Studies. But you know, she is incredible. So I uh, hope some administrators are listening. She's one of those people that, <laughs> that just make things happen. She, Every time I would contact her, she would make. Uh, she just made it so smooth. The whole arrangement for this. So, so thank you, Danielle. Uh, thanks, the dean, everyone, uh, the co-sponsors. It's just lovely to be here. Um, and thank you for coming out at this time. You know, you could be. I'm sure there are a lot of things that you could be doing, uh, but you've come here to listen to me. So thank you. I appreciate it. Uh, my ti the title of my see this works okay of my talk this evening 
is Eight Phases of African-American Reinvention of Africa. The Invention of Africa. So, V.Y. Mudimbe, this uh, African philosopher who was, was very prolific, he was an inspiration to me when I was in graduate school. Uh, and I was talking to one of your professors here, uh, Provinder Jacobs, earlier when we were talking about how inspirational he was. So, and um, he has this idea of the invention of Africa. So my talk uses uh, that idea of the invention of Africa as a point of departure. So Mudimbe's idea of the invention of Africa refers to a long European intellectual genealogy that over time produced narratives, discourses, and tropes about Africa and African peoples and cultures. These inventions became so dominant that they colored the ways successive groups of Europeans, including colonizers, uh, saw and portrayed Africa, constituting what Mudimbe calls the colonial library. The invention of Africa also inflected the terms that scholars used to study and understand the continent and its peoples. European representations of Africa date back to antiquity, but it, intensi it intens intensified in the 15th century as Europeans directly encountered African societies beyond the Sahara. So in this talk, I want to extend Mudimbe's invention of Africa thesis to African Americans and their Africa-facing political and intellectual projects. I argue that it was not just Europeans and Arabs who invented troops of Africa for their own purposes. Rather, as I will demonstrate in this lecture, African Americans were prolific producers of usable ideas and troops of Africa. They invented many Africas at different times for different purposes. Hence, my concept of the African American invention of Africa. African American, uh, this, this idea of the African American invention of Africa, uh, I use this term to refer to a series of strategic meanings and idioms created by African Americans as cognates for Africa from the mid 19th century to the present. These idioms of Africa have produced corresponding engagements and imaginations that have been curated and documented. African, African Americans have, at each juncture, transmitted these constructs of Africa into their political and intellectual toolbox as a source of legitimacy and ideational inspiration. I start this lecture with a brief chronological survey of earlier Greco-Roman, Arab, and European inventions of Africa before focusing on the African-American inventions of Africa. In the writings of Greco-Roman travelers and historians such as Thucydides, Pliny, and Herodotus, Africa featured prominently as the contrastive other. These Greco-Roman travelers, writers, and historians wrote extensively on North Africa. At various times between antiquity and the Arab conquest of the seventh century, Greco-Roman writings on North Africa, at the time, the only known part of the continent, used the term Libya for the entire region. They also used Abyssinia and Ethiopia interchangeably to designate the Aksumite and Ethiopian empires and the Horn of Africa. The rest of the African continent on the southern side of the Sahara, what some people call Black Africa, remained a mystery to Greco-Roman writers and observers. Beyond labeling all of it Nubia, they could only imagine and speculate on its human, material, cultural, and ideational content. In this ignorance, Greco-Roman travelers Specu speculated widely on the human and non-human presence in Africa beyond the Sahara. Uh, 
fantastical theories about African peoples proliferated in their writings. Speculative representations about the peoples who lived beyond the Sahara Desert, how they conducted themselves, and what cultures they practiced thrived in the scribal repertoires of Greco-Roman writers. Second-hand Amazigh or Berber stories conveyed from the northern and southern edges of the Sahara made their way into this narrative and discursive space, providing materials for more speculative and inaccurate portrayals of African societies beyond the Sahara. In the Greco-Roman discursive invention of Africa, the continent was homogenized into a singularity, undifferentiated and unvarying. Its parts were substituted for its whole and vice versa. Africa was rendered visible only as a flattened signifier of a distant humanity. One dominant recurring trope of this Greco-Roman period of Africa's invention was the idea that Africans who lived beyond the Sahara were mysterious, inscrutable, and insular. An 18th century Greek poet leaned on existing discursive fantasies on Africa to portray the continent as a mystical, alluring, unspoiled zone of enchantment. The romantic and sexualized idea of Africa as a rustic and rich virgin territory, magically seducing and inviting adventurous outsiders was born in this process. Howard French argues in his book, Born in Blackness, that this idea of, of Africa as a uniquely endowed and inviting place would take on a life of its own as a justification for Portuguese incursions into Africa in the 15th century. These incursions, French shows, would in later centuries produce intra and inter-European rivalries that caused tragic consequences including colonization and new world plantation slavery. Let me go to the Arab invention of Africa now. In the Arab phase of Africa's invention or reinvention, some of the established tropes of homogenization through naming persisted. A corollary feature was the creation of distinctions at different periods between different zones of Africa, which was also done through the practice of geographical naming. Arab geographers invented and repurposed names for whole or parts of Africa. Finally, they settled on the, on term, on the terms Bilad al-Sudan, land of the blacks, and Zanj as designators of West and East Africa respectively. In doing so, they perpetuated the existing notion of an Africa divided by the Sahara Desert. In their narratives, the Sahara performed the role of a racial divide between the zones of whiteness and that of blackness, with blackness markedly presented as a congenital deficit. This fictive idea of the Sahara as a divide rather than a highway of intra-African mobility and exchange is invalidated by evidence of ancient and medieval human and cultural interactions across the desert. You may recognize, you meaning you seated here <laughs> this evening, you may recognize the ideational residue of this construct of Saharan racial divide in the increasingly controversial term sub-Saharan Africa. While Arab writings on Africa did not engage in the wild, value-laden speculations of earlier Greco-Roman texts, the Arab geographical inventions of Africa also homogenized black African societies into an undifferentiated sphere of blackness for the discursive purpose of contrasted, contrasting them with their own Arab and North African societies. Medieval Arab commentary on Africa reinforced the existing tropes of African peoples as backward, uncivilized, barbaric, and inferior. Through these narrative inventions of, although these narrative inventions of Africa 
were interspersed with positive, flattering commentary on some aspects of African life that they observed or heard about in African societies. The unnamed reference for the, for the negative moral commentaries on African societies were Arab societies deemed more civilized by the author's standards and judgment. Arab geographers, travelers, writers, and commentators invented an Africa that they understood and represented through an avuncular racist imagination. The idioms deployed in these discursive projects included the well-known bigotry of lowered paternalistic expectations, as well as the rhetoric of infantilization and backhanded compliments. I now move to the European inventions of Africa. The cumulative effect of this existing, uh, of this existing invent invented signifiers of Africa was that on the eve of the, European, of the African encounter with Europe in the 15th century, one overarching image of Africa had been established in the minds of Europeans that of Africa as a benighted humanity, unable to rise on its own. This image was complemented by the notion that Africa had gold and other wealth and other resources in abundance, but either had no internal use for the resources or was unable to, to extract them optimally. European writers, travelers, missionaries, adventurers, traders, and col colonists from the 15th to the 19th century invented an Africa that suited their missions and intentions towards the continent. By the time of the European encounter with Africa, the name Africa had become established as a geographical reference for all of the continent. It had also been imbued with negative connotations, value assumptions, and cognate stereotypes. It is this constellation of invented fictive but dominant associations and assumptions that uh, about Africa's alterity and inferiority that V.Y. Modimbe calls the invention of Africa. What emerged from this project of discursive othering was an imaginary Africa that was unfaithful to the actually existing Africa. From the 15th century onwards, Europeans steadily upheld and reinforced the existing negative tropes on Africa, while manufacturing new ones as they sought to dominate and exploit the continent. Africa had started its life as what Basil Davison, quoting a European medieval text, calls a different but equal other. However, with the post-enlightenment emergence of Europe as a global economic and military force, and as a self-ascribed center of modernity. Subsequent direct and indirect representations of Africa in European art, travel accounts, philosophical writings, and in the racial science of eugenics took on a decidedly negative and racist character. The notion of Africa needing to be civilized by Europe crystallized in politically and intellectually salient ways. In this modern European imaginary of Africa, the reality and constructed fantasies of Africa's wealth converged to produce an image of Africa as a center of resource extraction. The Portuguese quest for gold reserves fizzled out pretty quickly because the reserves had either been depleted or sat beyond the reach or sat beyond their reach in the African interior. Unable to find gold in the speculative quantity, the Portuguese changed their attitude towards the African societies they encountered. Portuguese narratives of Africa morphed from one of qualified respect and adoration to one of angry, arrogant inferiorization. Because the Portuguese had set out to use the gold of Africa to fuel their expansionist adventures in the New World, and had expended resources and energy in exploring the coasts of the continent, there was no going back from Africa for them. 
Instead, they pivoted to a new discourse of Africa as both a market for European and Asian luxury goods and a labor reserve. The foundations of the transatlantic slave trade was laid in this process. The subsequent development of European imperial territorial acquisition in the New World and the advent of plantation slavery there gave the Portuguese and their European competitors a new template for understanding and relating to Africa. For the purpose of authorizing and justifying the enslavement of Africans in, the new, in new world plantations, Africa was reinvented simultaneously and coextensively in European discourses as a land of excess humanity. Africa was reinvented as the abode of primitive, strong, disease-hardened humans who were not only naturally suited to chattel slavery, but also needed its disciplined, regimented brutality for their own civilizational improvement. The new regime of European resource and labor extraction in Africa, which lasted from the 15th century to the end of colonization in the 1960s, spawned multiple additional constructs that dehumanized and devalued Africa and Africans. Africa's five centuries of exploitation and subjugation and Africa's diminishing humanity in European representational texts were symbiotically linked. The European invention of Africa was not a neutral, abstract, racialist undertaking. It was, a high, it was the high stakes beginning of what we today call racial capitalism. Racism and capitalism, as Eric Williams asserted a long time ago, are intertwined and mutually constitutive. The enduring discursive byproduct of this racism, capitalism, historical nexus is a constellation of racist stereotypes about Africa and Africans. This modern invention of Africa in an overwhelmingly negative and racist frame authorized the colonial invasion of the continent under the guise of the white man's burden and notions of humanitarian empire. A corollary of the emergence of a vast European representational library on Africa is the denial of Africa and Africans of a place in history, civilization, and the freedom of self-making. This European racist invention of Africa was provocative and needed a response. African-American inventions of Africa responded and continue to respond to this epistemological and political violence against Africa and Africans. Strands of African-American reinventions of Africa were therefore reactive in that they were responding to and seeking to append and establish popular and intellectual representations of Africa in the Euro-American Euro imagination. African-American taxonomies of Africa were also proactive in the sense that they sought to self-consciously produce an instrumental and strategic idea of Africa that was grounded in and designed for the African-American freedom struggle. These strategic idioms of Africa preempted and vitiated Eurocentric perspective on Africa while doing critical work for the African-American freedom struggle. In this way, some African-American reinventions of Africa brought together both the reactive and proactive elements of African-American engagements with Africa. I now turn to my, my attention to the African-American inventions and reinventions of Africa, beginning with the first phase. Africa is black and proud, but needs Christian modernity. This is the first page that I will be speaking about. The task of reinventing Africa by refuting its negative associations in Eurocentric discourses and of making a case for Africa as a positive civilizational actor in human history was first taken up by African-Americans and diaspora intellectuals, not by Africans. 
This is a significant point that we may, we may return to this later on uh, in the Q&A uh, session. One of these African-Americans was Alexander Cromwell. Born in 1819, Cromwell, who is often called the father of Pan-Africanism, moved to, to, Liberia, to Liberia, a nation state founded by formerly enslaved black Americans in 1853. He lived there until 1873 when he moved back to the United States. It was he who first broached and articulated the idea of black racial solidarity that would unite continental and diasporic Africans in one transnational community animated by black nationalism and self-propelled economic development. The Africa that Cromwell presented in his writings was livable and hospitable to immigrants. It was not the savage Africa invented and enunciated in European texts. Cromwell emptied Africa of the negative traits Europeans had constructed for it and repopulated the name Africa with positive attributes. Cromwell was one in a long line of African-American and diasporic activists urging the emigration of racially oppressed African-Americans to Africa. This early to mid 19th century effort to discursively remake Africa into a habitable refuge for Africans everywhere also reimagined Africa as a continent of a proud black humanity. This invented idea of Africa spawned an enduring discourse that helped to dislodge the prior negative images of Africa. It also, more crucially, humanized or rehumanized Africans. It ultimately inspired the emergence of Marcus Garvey's United Negro Improvement Association, which sought to retrieve Africa from the existing Euro European discourses of devaluation as a way of encouraging African Americans to emigrate to Africa. Another diasporic African, Edward Blyden, espoused the moral astuteness of Africans, the beauty of African culture as a unifying signifier, and a Pan-African racial consciousness that would dissolve intra-racial divisions and differences. Blyden wrote Africa and Africans back into the conversations about civilization and progress. I move to the, the second uh, phase. Africa as an African-American emigrationist uh, refuge or destination. There is a long tradition in New World African diaspora of return to Africa movement. In the 19th century, several African-American emigrationist movements flourished. I'm sure uh, there are some high schoolers here and some even some of the undergraduates say, I think you've heard about the Exodusters, right? The Exodusters, you know? No? Yes, okay. The, the migration to the West, but this were, this were, those were not the only emigrationists. Uh, there were other emigrationists that advocated movement back, not to, not to a westward migration, but uh, Africa mi migration back to Africa. So in the 19th century, several African-American emigrationist movements flourished, these movements saw themselves as both return and civilizing movements. African Americans would return to Africa, not just to escape racism in America, but to civilize Africans. Return was posited both as liberation and a black-on-black -black civilizing mission. In addition to seeking individual and group freedom in Africa, the emigrationists wanted to leverage their exposure and education in the United States to uplift a backward, heathen continent seen as incapable of developing itself without external help from those who possessed civilizational ap the civilizational aptitudes of Christianity, Western education, and post-enlightenment modernity. They echoed the contemporaneous writings of diaspora Pan-Africanist intellectuals, such as Blyden and Cromwell, who similarly saw themselves as black civilizing agents in Africa. In their speeches and writings, the emigrationists, the African-American emigrationists, constructed Africa 
as a welcoming motherland, a place of both origin and a new beginning. I move to the third phase, Africa as a place needing freedom and colonization. In the late 19th century and in the first decade of the 20th century, African-American missionaries in the Congo Free State of King Leopold II of Belgium were responsible for exposing the atrocities being committed against Africans by the king, his concessionary companies, and Arab and Swahili enforcers appointed by these colonizing entities. The Reverend William Henry Shepard, a Virginia-born Presbyterian missionary, was instrumental in documenting and then secretly disseminating photographs and other grisly evidence of King Leopold's crimes to the New York Times and other media outlets. The evidence was published, contributing to the international outrage that led to Leopold being stripped of the Congo in 1908. Shepard and other African-American missionaries reinvented Africa as a colonial crime scene and as a place lacking and needing freedom. This was an incipient anti-colonial intellectual agenda that inspired more anti-colonial critique in African-American communities. Beginning in the 1880s, published African-American anti-colonial critiques became an integral part of the black freedom struggle in America. These critiques intensified during the partition, the partition of Africa at the Berlin Conference in 1884. They were expressed through a variety of mediums, cartoons, newspaper essays, sermons in African-American churches, speeches, and marches. This African-American anti-colonial activism continued into the 1920s when the aftermath of World War I promised but then closed the possibility of African liberation. A new reinvigorated phase of African-American anti-colonialism began with the outrage generated by the second Italian invasion of Ethiopia in 1935. It continued throughout the 1940s and 1950s with African-American churches, organizations, individuals, and movements lobbying the United States government, publishing anti-colonial essays in newspapers, marching in support of anti-colonial movements in Africa, and organizing and collecting relief materials and funds for the ANC in South Africa and striking workers in Nigeria. Now I go to uh, the fourth phase, which is uh, this lecture. It's not lost on me that this lecture is named the Du Bois Distinguished Lecture. So I had to work him in somehow. You knew I had to work. I had to do that. All right? So this is Du Bois's Africa. Um, du Bois's Africa is a glorious, it's a place of glorious ancestral origin. Prominent African American scholar and civil rights pioneer, W.E.B. Du Bois, devoted two chapters of his 1915 book, The Negro, to two interrelated tasks. In the first chapter, titled Africa, Du Bois goes to great lengths to demonstrate that Africans, ancient and modern, were not the caricatures portrayed in European writings, but were full contributing members of the human community. Du Bois was one of the first scholars to insist that the Ethiopian, Egyptian, and Kushite civilizations of ancient and medieval times were part of the civilizational repertoire of the world. He did so to challenge and disrupt Eurocentric discourses, which claimed that these civilizations were not created by black people, but by racially superior so-called Hamites. In chapter three of the Negro, Du Bois posits that, quote, Negroes were the beginners of civilization, unquote. He argued that the signs, sites, and objects of African civilizations were equal or superior to those of any contemporaneous European civilization. The chapter is a comprehensive survey of the impressive civilizational artifacts of African peoples from Cape 
to Cairo. Like other African-American intellectuals, Du Bois was intellectually recreating or reinventing Africa in a way that valorized and humanized its inhabitants. He enlisted Africans and their highlighted accomplishments as a reference for ancestral pride among African-Americans. African-American intellectuals and activists recognized long before Africans did that for Africa to be a positive frame of reference for black liberation struggles, it had to be reinvented and reclaimed from the epistem epistemic hegemony of Eurocentric agendas. The Africa created and refined in African-American discourse was still a homogenized one. It was still the undifferentiated Africa of earlier, earlier European discourse. However, this new homogeneity was not a negative erasure produced by an imperial or racist impulse. Rather, it was a product, product of what Gayatri Spivak calls strategic essentialism. This is a process whereby subaltern activists self-consciously and in disregard of philosophical and intellectual contradictions adopt an essentialist and homogenizing gaze on identity, or as Spivak puts it, they take the risk of essence. They do so because such an essentialist and uncomplicated construct is critical to their struggle. In stripping Africa of negative moral attributes and refitting it with positive ones, African-American intellectuals were inventing a basis for Pan-African solidarity, which they hoped would serve their struggle in America and bridge the geographies of black consciousness. Of the fifth phase now. African-American engagements with Africa were not restricted to the realm of intellectual reinvention. Du Bois wrote and organized to criticize and protest Euro-American Euro racism, to posit the color line as the overarching challenge of the 20th century, to call for Pan-African unity in the struggle against white supremacy, to critique the racial contradictions of World War I, and to challenge Europe to fulfill the humanistic proclamations and promises made during World War II. In all this, his consistent reference was Africa and its colonial predicament. Du Bois was arguably the loudest voice against European colonization of Africa, but he was hardly the only African-American anti-colonial activist. As Sylvia Jacob and Penny von Eschen show in their books, African-Americans through multiple mediums vigorously protested European colonial narratives and actions that desecrated and victimized Africans. We move to the sixth phase. Africa as a place of refuge and uh, security. Colonial era investments in the, uh, in the freedom struggles of Africans prefigured a new wave of African-American migration to Africa in the 1950s and 1960s, a period which saw hundreds of African-Americans, including W.E.B. Du Bois, move to Accra, uh, Conakry, and Dar es Salaam to take up residency. The African-Americans were refugee, refugees from America's violent persecution of civil rights activists, but they were also supporters of and contributors to the development of newly independent African nations. These African-American residences in post-independence Africa were practical investments in the ideals of racial solidarity in Pan-Africanism. An African nexus to borrow a term coined by Sylvia Jacobs, emerged from these African-American gestures of transatlantic return. Du Bois's invented Africa was a welcoming place of return. It was a place of origin and ancestry. This Du Boisian construct of Africa as the place of ancestral, ancestral inspiration and legitimacy would continue to influence and under, underpin subsequent African-American inventions of Africa. You go to seven. Uh, 
So African America, African, Africa as a place of ancestral origin again, the, the, the DNA revolution, the ancestral DNA revolution. Peoples of African descent around the world, especially those whose ancestors were forcefully displaced from Africa centuries ago, have flocked to the science of genealogy to connect the missing dots in their ancestry. How many of you have taken the, okay, the, the test, the you know, ancestral DNA test? Okay, several hands, great. I'm speaking to you now directly. <laughs> so they have flocked to the science of genealogy to connect the missing dots in their ancestry. While there is an emotional element to the quest to locate African ancestral origins, I argue that the African-American ancestral DNA revolution is one of the newest iterations of a diasporic invention of Africa. African-American ancestral DNA discoveries about their ethnic and regional origins in Africa restore to African pre-colonial ethnic, restore to Africa, uh, restore to pre-colonial Africa. I have to say this right. This is critical. This is very important for my argument here. So this, this, the discoveries restore to pre-colonial Africa ethnic and cultural coherence and legibility that are often denied it in Eurocentric discourses. I'm glad I said that correctly, because this is, this is important. Uh, critiques of what Victoria Massey calls genetic recon reconnection programs have emerged as patronage of ancestral DNA science has increased. In her book, Native American DNA, Kim Tolbert argues that the scientific precision of DNA is a double-edged sword, which is undermining modes of tribal belonging that have been historically understood in social and historical narratives modulated by tribal wisdom. In her own book, which is titled The Social Life of DNA, Alondra Nelson cautions that while African-American ancestral DNA can help reconnect African-Americans to their African ancestral homelands, reconcile families fragmented by slavery, and illuminate historical traumas and injustices, it can neither supply all the answers African-Americans seek, nor heal all historical and social injuries. These critiques are important and valid, but in my opinion, they miss the broader intellectual significance of African-American ancestral DNA science for a continent credited with little cultural, ethnic, and political order prior to its encounter with the white man. The critics also fail, in my opinion, to appreciate the inadvertent benefit of ancestral DNA science in clarifying the pre-colonial diversity of the African continent. It is true, as critics of personalized African-American DNA ancestry, ancestry science have asserted, that the scientific answer that it provides for the ancestral quests of African-Americans approximates a construct of ethnicity and ethnic origin that is recent and that formed and changed over time. That is true. Indeed, ancestral DNA results do not account for the originary fluidity of Afri African ethnicity, for migratory activity, for goings and comings, for circles of state formation and state collapse, and for the demographic displacements and reconstitutions that we know to be features of pre-colonial African history. However, you knew however, however was coming, right? You knew that I was gonna come up with however. However, Insofar as African Americans are using ancestral DNA science to articulate the idea of African spaces as places of origin corresponding roughly to today's ethnic categories, they are reinventing or inventing what Africa was, what it means, and the work that it should do for those who were forcefully exiled from the continent. The, these African-American users of ancestral DNA are constructing a new African historical semiotic that rejects a suffocating intellectual tyranny which demands 
proof of precise, unbroken, transhistorical ethnic origin as a condition for the assertion of ethnic provenance in the present. As anthropologist Victoria Massey argues, critique, critiques of African genetic ancestry are grounded in notions of biological essentialism that are not only untenable, but work to prevent a reckoning on racism and contemporary processes of racialization. By the way, she also argues that these critiques also fail to recognize the ways in which uh, this ancestral DNA quest uh, are grounded in African and African-American notions of kinship, the importance of kinship. Needless to say, such teleo teleological ethnic genealogy is not possible or demanded for Europe or any other part of the world. Moreover, rigid ethnic classificatory systems are themselves legacies of colonialism. They are not primordial continuities from pre-colonial African times. African-American consumers of ancestral DNA services are therefore, in my opinion, inventing Africa as a usable, meaningful, and knowable place. They are engaged in the creation of origins in Africa and in a demystification and illumination of pre-colonial African humanity. African-American ancestral DNA, DNA projects restore polities, cultures, nations, and coherent agglomeration of peoples and units of sociopolitical solidarity to pre-colonial Africa. These are qualities that are associated with early modern Europe, but rarely with pre-colonial Africa, which was and is still analyzed by some people as a place without real nations, cohesive communities, and bounded ethnic cultures. African-American ancestral DNA work rejects this fictional Africa of European invention. It replaces, even if historically, this prejudiced rendering of pre-colonial Africa with an Africa that was not an undifferentiated mass of formless humanity, but was rather a place where everyone knew who they were, ethnically speaking. Even if ethnicity had a different connotation then than it does today. This work of reclaiming and reconstituting African, the African pre-colonial past against Eurocentric erasure necessarily requires ignoring ethnic instability, the ethnic instability of pre-colonial Africa. Moreover, Eurocentric inventions of Africa, which African-American ancestral DNA work rejects, never allowed the conceptual nuances of history and anthropology as modern Western knowledge formations to get in the way of their distortion of African history. The task of using the science of genetics to correct the construct of a perpetually warring pre-colonial Africa with no enduring ethnic or political organization should not be held back by pedantic concerns about the difficulty of precisely locating ethnicity in early, medieval, and pre-modern Africa. African-American ancestral DNA represents not just a robust refutation of an invented European image of Africa. It is also an effort to reinvent the continent as a capacious place of origin where men, women, and children were, were forcefully and violently plucked from cohesive, functioning, and coherent ethno-linguistic communities that can be mapped and geographically located through DNA research. This insistence on, on, on an Africa marked by coherent ethnic communities and nations prior to the encounter with Europe is analogous to the earlier work done by W.E.B. Du Bois to recast Africa as a place of civilization and enlightened humanity in opposition to the circulating idea of Africa as a place of desolation, savagery, and statelessness. Finally, 
African-American ancestral DNA reengages Africa as a place of answers to long-held identity questions. It resolves questions of identity and selfhood by supplying modern clues, no matter how imprecise, to the ambiguities of origins and separation that constrains the self-making of African-Americans. And that brings us to the final phase. Wakandan Africa as avatar of global Af Afrofuturism. The Marvel Comics movie, Black Panther, is more than a feel-good moment for Africans and people of African descent. It is a bold counterpoint to the intellectual and psychic violence of Afro-pessimism and Afro-defeatism. Afro-pessimism advances a consistent bromide of Africa's dysfunction, one that does not acknowledge the socioeconomic and political prospects of the continent. Afro-defeatism is my coinage and is a lexical cousin to Afro-pessimism. The Afro-defeatist perspective on Africa refers to the view that it is futile and even counterproductive to resist invidious external forces. Afro-defeatists can point to Africa's history of unsuccessful attempts to shake off the yoke of colonialism, neocolonialism, external dependency, and other negative phenomena unleashed on the continent by external actors. African colonial history is a history of lost causes and defeated resistance movements. The list of lost causes and futile resistance struggles in Africa is long, tragic, and depressing. Where African nationalists and Afrocentric thinkers see heroic resistance against colonialism, afro defeatists see the futility of resistance. In pre-colonial times, Africa's long history of defeats engendered a narrative, or rather in post-colonial times, Africa's long history of defeats engendered a narrative of dystopia and fatalism, which has been countered by a discourse of nationalist restoration and Pan-African reclamation. In this project of correcting a defeatist history of Africa, defeats and conquests are rewritten as heroic nationalist resistance. The Black Panther franchise wades into this debate, but also transcends it. It rewrites the moment of the original colonial encounter. The fictional country of Wakanda is a stand-in for Africa. We are told that it pres preserved its independence by repelling a foreign colonial invasion. Wakanda embodies an Africa in which the colonial project came undone because the resistance of Africans succeeded in defeating the colonial invasion, preserving African sovereignty. This interpretation does not correspond empirically to much of African history, but its Afrofuturistic audacity is powerful and relies on a fantastical retelling of the past. Wakanda's presentation in Black Panther reinvents Africa as its past, reinvents Africa and its past in a deliberately a historical and futuristic template. Black Panther is African history imagined radically differently. It is a counterfactual history that ignores the tendency of historians to write the past backwards from the present. Instead, it reimagines the beginning of the story and then highlights what could have happened, the various roads not taken and the possible trajectories that fizzled out. Black Panther asks, what if African anti-colonial resistance movements had succeeded? What kind of present and future would Africa have? Wakanda is the emphatic answer to this question. Black Panther answers its own question. Wakanda's resilience and triumph are catalyzed by resources, knowledge, and expertise from Africa and the African diaspora. Black Panther makes a case for the intertwined fates of Africa and African America. Wakanda, I argue, 
Is Africa reinvented as a site of freedom and victory against imperialism and neocolonialism? It is Africa as African Americans would want it to be, a beacon of pride and accomplishment for black people all over the world, a composite of a people and place reborn and reclaimed from the clutches of European marauders. The African American provenance of the franchise its popularity in African-American communities, and its resonance with earlier African-American romantic imaginations of Africa invented a new idiom of Africa in the African-American consciousness. More crucially, the enthusiastic participation of African-Americans in the iconographies and visual artifacts of Black Panther indicates that the movie encapsulates a long-running African-American tradition of factual, fictive, and fantastic invention of Africa. I want to end this talk by positing the importance uh, of another African-American intellectual tradition that does not simply invent or reinvent Africa as a place of origin that must be given a positive makeover. From the mid-19th century to the early 20th, uh, 21st century, African Americans invented different Africas for different ideological and political purposes at different times. But they did not just look upon Africa as a place of origin or as a motherland that should be engaged only as a place of the past where African Americans had their beginning. They also forged what Adam Getachew calls a coeval politics. They imagined the political struggles of their time as connected to and coextensive with those of African peoples in simultaneous time. This transatlantic and international politics of connection, cooperation, and co-organizing was and still remains the natural, logical, and effectual successor to the African-American inventions and reinventions of Africa discussed in this talk. Thank you very much for listening. Want me to give you this? That is it. Is it? Uh, yeah, that's what I was Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> so, in the absence of um, a stationary mic, uh, if you have a question, please um, raise up your hand and you can come here and take the mic and ask your question. I guess I just answer right here. So, how are you doing today, Professor? That's good. So, with um, all the images by African Americans or their invention of Africa, how would you, how would you, in a sense, kind of like group them all together? Maybe is it possible in your mind to kind of like group them all together? Maybe to like a phrase, a sentence, some general statement, a possible like overlap between them because how I saw is like origin, security, inspiration, I kind of group them all together be like, oh, home, that's what they all envision, kind of like invent Africa as too, but I want to see your opinion on it too. Okay. <laughs> it's a great, great question. Uh, it's, it's something, you know, you've, you're giving me a new way of looking at all this now, right, to maybe come up with um, an overarching theory that ties all of it together, right? So that's, that's a great... Uh, I hadn't, hadn't thought about that, but if I were to attempt to answer your question, I, I guess I would say I like the word home, because so I think you know it's uh, it's one word, but I think in all of these eight faces of African American uh, invention or reinvention of Africa, I think you see that recurring theme of home, whether home is a place of origin or home is a place of inspiration or home is a place of um, legitimacy, 
or home is a place of refuge, right? Or home is a place of um, um, ancestry. I think, yeah, so I, I, like, I like that, uh, that word home. Because you asked me to use one word, or yeah, <laughs> you kind of li limited me there. You didn't give me a lot of uh, leeway. Uh, but, but yeah, I like, I like home, because uh, in, in that sense, home is just, it's not a place uh, that you live in necessarily, but it's a place that you can always go back to, to, to be refreshed, to be inspired, uh, home is a place where if you are in trouble, you go to and you go to the to, you go home and you feel safer, right? You feel safe. Uh, but home, you also defend your home. Is that right? So one of the faces, uh, thinking about one of them was about uh, Africa was a colonial crime scene that needed to be defended, that needed to be protected, right? African Americans had to get involved in the anti-colonial movement. That's another way to say that they, you know, they were defending their home against European colonialism, against the violence of colonialism, and so on and so forth. So uh, I, I, I want to thank you first of all for suggesting that word because I'm going to run with it. So that's, I mean, that word helps us to really conceptualize it all together, to theorize all of this together. Yes, because uh, home is really a, an evocative metaphor. Yeah. Hi. First of all, thank you. I took a lot of notes and I have a lot of questions in case no one has any other questions. I have a few. Um, but my first one is when and why do you think um, African American reinvention of Africa went from being more political or material to fantasy and imagination, like how you ended with Wakanda compared to say, Du Bois's um, invention of Africa? Yeah, an another great question. Yeah. But you know, the, the way that I think about this is um, that, you know, of course, you know, African-Americans are not a homogeneous group of people. They've never been, is that right? They've never been a homogeneous group of people. In Du Bois's time, you know, there were African-Americans who were engaged in the artistic endeavor who were engaged more or less in entertainment. There was the Harlem Renaissance, you know, a time of great artistic uh, flourishing. Uh, so uh, I, th I think at every moment in each one of these faces, there were African-Americans who were also engaging in Africa outside of the political realm, outside the realm of high politics. Du Bois was doing his thing, the Cromwell, Blyden, and others were doing their thing in the political realm. But there were also multiple other ways in which African Americans were engaging with Africa. I can think of, uh, for instance, um, uh, there's a great book by James Campbell that talks about the connection between the, the AME Church and South Africa, Songs of Zion, that's the title of the work, that this with this linkage. And this, this began in the late 19th century, early 20th century, where African Americans, African American choirs, the Jubilee Choir, you know? We're traveling to South Africa, you know, to perform jointly with uh, Zulu choirs in South Africa, but also forging connections and, and, and also coming up, inviting uh, uh, South African choirs to come here, and black choirs from South Africa to come here and perform. So these linkages were already going on in the artistic sphere, in the musical sphere, in theater, in all of this, and the, the political sphere was also there. So I don't think it was, uh, necessarily a break or a rupture or a change or a shift. I think it had always been there, even while Du Bois and others were preoccupied with the political dimension of African-American reinventions of Africa. Uh, there were a lot of African-Americans who were, if you like, uh, inventing Africa in artistic ways, in ways that uh, were not overtly political, but you know, to the extent that politics sometimes cannot be separated from the art. Uh, I think this was all part of the same imagination. And that's why I keep going back to the idea of home that the gentleman over there suggested. Because even among the artists, even in, when it comes to Wakanda, the conception is the same, the ancestral DNA. That, that, you, know, you can say that's not political. In some ways, it's not. But it's also, um, it's also both the political, the overtly political, and the artistic engagement with Africa, and the artistic, they were all, they were all grounded in this idea of Africa as a place of origin. 
as a place of ancestry, and therefore as a place requiring us to engage intensely with it. Does that make sense? And so I think that's the, that's the conception. I don't think it was a break, it was a shift necessarily. Uh, I think it's, uh, you know, African Americans are diverse. They've always been diverse. They've always been preoccupied with multiple ways to engage with Africa. And even while the political struggles and inventions were going on, the artistic engagements were also going on. Uh, I can think of other examples of black artists and black musicians. Fela is a good example, came to, Af you know, and basically he learned Pan-Africanism from African Americans, right? This is where he learned to be black. This is where he learned black consciousness. Fela, the popular, the late popular. So it, it's always been there. I can think Miriam Makiba, right? New York, you know, and then she married uh, Kwame Turi, Stockley Carmichael, right? And that's when, you know, she, not to say that she wasn't uh, conscious of her blackness, but that's really when she came into her own as a musician activist, right? So all of these engagements, you know, and, and of course Kwame uh, Turi uh, moved to Konakry. They moved, he moved together with uh, Mira Makiba. Uh, as part of that wave that I spoke about of African Americans migrating back to Africa, to post-colonial Africa. So I think it's, it's, uh, it's not so much of a shift as it is a simultaneous political, artistic engagement with Africa. So these reinventions and inventions were happening across multiple spheres, I would say. Yes. Good evening. Uh, my question is, do you, what are your thoughts on Pan-Africanism do you think um, it did, do you think it helped in any way? And basically, what do you think the flaws are and the good things that came from Pan-Africanism? And who's your favorite Pan-Africanist? Uh, that's, a, that's a hard one. I'll start with the last part. Who's my favorite Pan-Africanist? It's a very good one. I, you know, to be honest, I, I like Du Bois a lot. I've always liked him, not, not only because of his politics, but also because of his temperament, right? Du Bois was very pragmatic in his Pan-Africanism and, um, you know, knew when to uh, accentuate but also to tone down certain aspects of his politics to suit the times. So I like that. I like that, Pan that, that pragmatic uh, strain and tradition in Pan-Africanism. And I think Du Bois, to some extent, embodies that. When I think about other Pan-Africanists, it's very easy to pigeonhole them. It's very easy to put them in a box, in an ideological box. Du Bois, not so much. The Du Bois of 1915, when he wrote Africa, it's not the Du Bois that wrote the souls of black folk. It's not the Du Bois that, you know, so he evolved. So I like that, I like people who can evolve. Does that make sense? So, I, so, I, so, that, that, so I've gotten that part out of the way. So yeah, to the first part of your question in terms of the pros and cons. Pan-Africanism is a really empowering idea. Uh, it's a basis for solidarity uh, across geographies across cultures, because without that, without an ideational structure like that, it's very hard for people engaging in different, sometimes different struggles, sometimes separated by thousands of miles, to come together to imagine their futures together, to imagine the connections between their different struggles. So I think that was a very powerful idea, to connect people and to connect different struggles. Uh, the, one of the cons would be that, you know, black people, wherever they find themselves, they, they are pulled in different directions. They are pulled in different directions by the circumstances in which they find themselves in. Some, some of them found themselves living under colonial situations. Some of them found themselves living in, uh, under Jim Crow situations, uh, racial apartheid. In South Africa, it was a full-blown apartheid. Or you know some so the the, the 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 contours of the struggle, right, can pull Africans in multiple directions, and sometimes it's a matter of daily survival, quotidian the quotidian grind to survive, 
And that takes away some of the energy that is required to forge these types of solidarity. And so it is, it is a challenge, it is always a challenge to make Pan-Africanism you know, resonate across these different geographies and across these different landscapes of struggle. Does that make sense? So that's my, yeah, that would be one of the questions. Good evening, Professor. Thank you for your lecture. I was wondering what went into your research process and how did you come to define the different distinct reimaginations and reinventions of Africa? That's, that's a really good one. Uh, so I, you know, obviously, uh, as, a, as a graduate student at the University of Michigan, I'll take you right back, way back, maybe before you were born, <laughs> I, my minor field was in African-American history. And I trained under the great uh, Professor Kevin Gaines, who is at the University of Virginia, right? So, he, so I, I read up on um, you know, the historiography and of African-American history, uh, the canons. I, you know, I went through all the canons. I did an exam in the field and everything. One thing that kept occurring to me as I surveyed this vast literature of the African-American experience, as it were, was just the ways in which the, the imaginaries of Africa in these different periods and traditions of African-American history and African-American intellection kept changing and evolving. It just, it just occurred to me that the Africa that I, I would encounter in Antebellum writings, African-American writings, was not the same Africa as, the, as was portrayed in postbellum writings. And it was not the Africa that, was, 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 that I encountered in, civil, in the writings from the civil rights era or from the earlier period of Jim Crow and so on and so forth. So I just, I just that's, that's where the idea came from, to be honest with you. And then I got off, you know, I went off to do other work or that, do other research, but all the while thinking, how do I make this make sense? How do I put together a paper that would encapsulate my reflections, my decades long reflection on these changing notions of Africa? Right? And this changing notion was not, it wasn't something that was happening on its own volition. It was African Americans themselves who, for practical, pragmatic, uh, political purposes, were articulating Africa differently in a self conscious, deliberate fashion, so that at every juncture, Africa would do a particular work for African Americans, for the African American freedom struggle. And over time, some of these ideas that I presented today just kept coming to me, and I just kept fleshing them out. And so when I was asked to present, <laughs> to be, uh, when I got the invitation, I thought this was a great opportunity to finally put it all together. So that's the story. Yeah. Thank you. Hello. Um, my name is Jamie. Thank you so much for your time and energy and the fruits of your labor. I can't figure out how to articulate this question, but it seems politically complicated to me to imagine or reimagine a place that actually exists and that has, you know, an actual history and the peoples. And I guess I'm just sort of wondering or thinking about that as a form of colonization irrespective of whether it's African American people doing it. And so I guess I'm just wondering about African American people engaging in a reimagination of a place that exists and whether it's still a form of colonization but without the sort of systemic power to actually engage in colonization in the way that Europeans can, for example. Yeah, another great question. Um, <laughs> I would, <laughs> I would, um, you know, one of the passages that I read, let me start with that. One of the passages that I read in the lecture talks about how, I mean, I totally agree with you, by the way, it talks about how the African American uh, imagination that emerged in one of the faces, I think it was the Du Boisian face, or even after Du Bois, uh, was still the homogenized Africa. I don't know if you remember that part. Was still this homogenized Africa that was inherited from the Eurocentric and European invention, invention of Africa. So, even the, so I agree with you, even the African-American inventions of Africa 
wasn't totally devoid of some of the tropes and some of the idioms that you know were associated with the Euro, uh, European inventions of Africa, such as homogenization, this idea of Africa as one place, Africa as a country, right? But I, I also quickly pivoted to my defense of that, which is, the, I, that's where I invoked uh, the literary scholar Gayatri Spivak about strategic essentialism, right? You know, so there are certain, uh, in certain subaltern struggles, you have to do that type of work. You have to deliberately, intentionally singularize plural, diverse places. Because it's strategic, it's, it's deliberate, because that is what is useful for your struggle. If, you, if they had presented Africa as this multiplicity of cultures and ethnicities and this infinitely diverse place, well, that doesn't translate to America, to their struggle, to the urgency of their struggle in America. That doesn't work. That doesn't work. An Africa that is so fragmented doesn't work. Because and for, Af for Africa to work in, that, in those types of political projects, those, those intellectual projects in America, Africa necessarily had to be homogenized, right? So that was, that's where I'm coming from. Uh, that said, that said, uh, you know, I also talked about how, in, in a way, African Americans, especially in the Cromwell and Blyden period, in the earlier, late 19th century period, especially in the immigrationist phase, saw themselves as people who could potentially civilize Africans, right? People who were going to Africa. So it wasn't that they, they imagined, some of them bought into the idea of a backward Africa. Africa as a home of heathenism, right? Africa as a uh, home of savagery. They bought into the idea that Africa needed Christianity and post-enlightenment modernity. And they saw themselves as potentially the instruments, right? A more humane instrument, right? More humane than Europeans, right? But a more humane instrument, nonetheless, for Christianizing and civilizing Africans. So I would, I would, I would agree with you. The, my only point of difference would be that ideas and inventions are not created equal they don't enter into the discursive space with equal power. So while I have agreed with you on these terms, I don't think that African-American inventions of Africa carry the same amount of political weight or capital or power or operated at the, that level of power that European ideas did. Because European ideas and inventions of Africa were written and spoken into a charged political space that had the capacity to victimize Africans, that had the capacity to inferiorize and to devalue Africans. African-American inventions of Africa, while framed along the lines that you suggested, were uh, benign, uh, usable, instrumental constructs, right? And so that's, the, that's how I would approach it. These were exercises in strategic essentialism again, to invoke Spivak's uh, construct. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. Thank you. So um, thank you for your time. Thank you for answering our questions. Um, I especially enjoyed your seventh phase about, um, I believe it was the seventh, about ancestry. Um, I run up against this problem myself, doing my own DNA. Um, and I, I have 0.2% Nigerian, actually. You'll be pleased to know. Um, it requires a little bit of fudging. Um, you kind of have to arbitrarily choose a point to say, okay, this is the origin, and you know, and then everything goes from there. And so you have to set things in. You have to crystallize them a little bit at a certain point in time to say what you know nativeness is. Um, so there's a bit of fiction making there. Moving to the modern day, you have narratives like Black Panther, and of course they can be helpful in you know reimagining or make, maybe making new imaginings of Africa that might have positive impacts on public consciousness. So what is your take on the acceptability, or maybe what is the level of acceptable fiction making, a kind of um, historical fiction making that might be considered a little ahistorical sometimes, when you're um, producing more positive stories in the modern day? Yeah, it's a, it's a good one. Um, there's, a, there's always a bit of fiction in <clears throat> all narratives of identity, all narratives of solidarity, all of them. Uh, it's, you know, none of them is free. 
uh, it's all, it, you know, not to go all postmodern or postculturalist on you, but <laughs> yeah, but it's a little bit of uh, fiction. Fiction, I mean, and it's and and I'm not by saying that I'm not being dismissive of of, of that, but but I'm rather asserting the importance of constructive work, additional construction. The idea of uh, we all have our construct. We all come up with construct, especially when we are engaged in struggle, in political struggle. Uh, of especially high stakes political struggles. You know, we have to do a lot of uh, invention work. We have to do a lot of fictional work. And um, the question has to do with what, what level of that is permissible and how much of that, you know, pushes the envelope. Um, it's, it's not something that I've thought so much about. I've read the critics that I, some of whom I quoted of ancestral DNA and you know some of the limitations of that, and you know how you interpret it, and this and that. Uh, my point is to show that it is it is quite important. It gives us a tool, uh, gives especially for African Americans who have wrestled with this quest and these questions. It gives them a tool to reconnect with the continent in ways that they would never would never have been been able to do. But also on the African side, which is my main critique of the critics, is to say that it doesn't quite, they don't quite engage with how important these uh, DNA or ancestral reconnection projects are for Africa, for African history, especially for pre-colonial African history, especially because of all the epistemological violence that has been done to African pre-colonial history as a place of emptiness, as a place of disorder, as a place of uh, uh, incoherence, societal incoherence, proud to the coming of the white man. So I, 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 to answer your question directly, I know I'm, I'm, I've rambled a little bit, but to answer your question directly, the fictional element does not discredit the project. Uh, I, I, it's not a disqualifier at all, because there's a fiction, there's a little bit of fiction in all identity claims, and in all projects that involve making those kinds of claims. Does that make sense? Uh, and and uh, this is no different. Uh, hi, uh, there is so much for your work. Uh, so I'm curious, what do you think could be like the future of like how African Americans and like, the African diaspora like, are like, reinvent Africa, view Africa, like, where do you think this like go in the future? This, this, this is uh, the last part of my lecture. This is <laughs> yeah, the last part of my lecture. What do I see in the horizon in terms of this African-American uh, invention of Africa? Um, I think I see more of the Wakandan, Black Panther, futuristic themes being built upon. I, I, I actually see a lot of uh, promise for that, for that Afrofuturistic uh, reinventions, especially now that African Americans uh, are building their own studios. Tyler Perry, right? Tyler Perry has a studio, and African Americans have made quite an inroad into Hollywood. Uh, even Black Panther, I think they are expanding it. They, are, they have certain certain other things in the works. And since this was this was so successful, since Black Panther was so successful, uh, especially this theme of uh, reconnecting Africa, Wakanda being the composite of Africa, but also harnessing, at least in uh, cinematic terms, the energies of Africa and African-Americans to present this story. I think I see that, uh, I don't know where it goes, but I think I see it developing further. The other strand that I see also, uh, more, I see in the future, is also this idea of coeval politics as I, that I spoke about in the last part of my lecture. This idea of um, not just reconnecting to Africa or reinventing Africa, as a place of origin, as a place of the past, but reimagining Africa as a place that has relevance for African American struggle in the present, that is connected to African American struggles that have consequence for the African American struggles in the, in the present, that has the capacity to undermine or to enhance the fortunes of African-Americans' uh, struggles uh, in simultaneous time, 
but that is, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to invoke Benedict Anderson, this idea of simultaneity, coevalness. You know, it's not just, oh, let's look, let's look back on Africa and pick and get inspired, or let's go back to Africa as a land of ancestry. It's also how can we reimagine Africa as a place that is useful for us now, presently? How can we connect our struggles to struggles occurring in Africa in the present? in simultaneous time. Okay? Those are the two strands. Thank you for your time and also for the presentation. Um, I don't know whether my question is out, out of scope of what you have discussed, but when you started the presentation and through the end of the presentation, the question keep on coming. Even if it's outside the scope, just give me your opinion. I wanted to find out. I, I looked through your presentation. Where was or where is African Voices in this whole um, uh, reinvention and reimagination? Did African Voices matter? Or does African, African count it? Because all the presentation was like how Europeans, Arabs, and African Americans are imagining Africa. How does Africans imagine themselves? Yeah, great question. Um, it's it's uh, it's the way. It's one of the limitations of the work. I mean, it's not a limitation per se. It's just the way that I've conceived of it, which is to move away. I mean, I've written extensively about you know Africans and African um, portrayals of Africa, Africans on Africans' understandings of themselves of their continent. I've published quite a bit on that. And I just felt it was time to move a little bit into this intellectual territory of looking at this wider, broader um, interaction between, like you said, how Africans see themselves, African voices, but also African Americans and other diasporic voices. Because I think one of the things that um, is missing, I would say, is you know, I, I was an undergraduate in Nigeria. I, I did my undergraduate in Nigeria. I, there was no class in college. There was no class on African-American history that I could take. If there had been, I would have taken it. Just wasn't. And I, I know there, is, there are still, I, I, I don't know of any university in Nigeria or any African country that offers it. There's, an, there's finally, finally now, a center I believe a center for American studies or a center for African American studies, the first of its, of its kind in Africa that was established five years ago maybe at the University of uh, Cape Town in South Africa. That's the first one. Think about that. Just let that simmer in your head. What I'm trying to get at is that we don't know enough about how the diaspora, how African Americans see Africa because we haven't invested the intellectual resources and the energies required for that knowledge to emerge. That is it. But we know a lot about what Africans think about Africa and so on and so forth. And I think people are beginning, we're, we're, people are beginning to realize that you, you, we, we need to have that perspective. We need to have, and that's why this center was established and they're trying to, I think they're even, they're even thinking about establishing a PhD program. You know, and that would be radical, that would be revolutionary. So we're trying to flip the script a little bit so that we, <laughs> that's what we're getting at. Yes, no problem. Okay. Um, that was actually one of my questions, so I'm glad he asked that. But I know towards the end you kind of critiqued Afro-pessimism as defeatist, and a lot of others feel like it doesn't allow space for organizing or moving towards an actual goal. Um, but since Afro-pessimists essentially think that the world is, you know, based on and formed upon anti-blackness. Do you think that that could be another phase of reinvention or that this is a way to, Afro-pessimism is a way to move past the kind of voyeuristic or like helicopter inventions of Africa towards something that's more real, I guess, if that makes sense? Uh, yeah, you know, I'm not one of the scholars that dismisses Afro-pessimism offhand. I don't, I don't do that. 
I want to understand it, and I engage with it. And there are strands of Afro-pessimistic thinking, let's put it that way, that I think are useful in getting us to do some introspection, let's put it that way as well. Uh, in other words, even within the African-American community, there is a kind of engagement with Africa that you could characterize as being Afro-pessimistic, right? This idea or that Africa hasn't, for instance, Africa hasn't lived up to its promise or to its potential, right? That's one strand, correct? This idea that Africa has disappointed its children, let's say, you know, in the diaspora, right? And this idea that, uh, you know, that Africa continues to underperform and therefore to negatively uh, reflect on African Americans and other diasporic communities. Is that right? So you could you could characterize that as a kind of Afro pessimism, and but for me, it's useful. It's useful as a counterpoint, if you like, to some of what I've presented here. I haven't present. I haven't made that another face here. I haven't put it as another face, but it could be. It could very well be. Uh, it's just that. When I was researching this and when I was writing this, to be honest, I just didn't see enough evidence, just the raw evidence. It exists, but it's something that I definitely would have to think about as I develop this research and I develop this paper. Uh, because I think I, one could find the evidence because I've seen you know, bits and pieces of these types of narratives within African-American communities that are trying to engage with Africa using this frame um, and, and, I, and I think, yeah, I think you could, you could uh, label it Afro-pessimism of some kind, uh, but I think it's useful. I think it's useful as well, because again, the, uh, all of these inventions are perspectival. They depend on perspective. They depend on, you know, and, and they are Afri even all of the, in all of these faces, there were African-Americans who did not necessarily buy into this dominant view of Af views of Africa or portrayals or inventions of Africa. And I think one needs to account for that. As a historian, I feel like I should account for that as well. So, so thank you for that comment. One more question, please. <laughs> Sorry. Um, hi. It's nice to meet you. My name is Miles. Um, <clears throat> I do appreciate, you know, I appreciate your time and whatnot you've been bringing to your presentation, even though I may have showed up a little late. Um, I think there was a lot of great viewpoints and a lot of great understanding. Um, but one curiosity that came to mind was how we talk about reinvention and you know reimagination, modern imagination compared to previous. This is not in reference to myself, but for those who are born of mixed descent or post-colonialism, you know, for those who are born of unfortunately like rape and whatnot, those who are like have and have, how would you say in the best terms that they can reimagine or in a sense pay respects to what Africa has provided, in a sense, to their upbringing, in a sense, to like a mixed standpoint. I mean, I, I, identity questions are not always resolved in either or uh, frames. The you know they are always about you know adding to who you are when you go on this quest, for instance, to know who you are. We all want to know who we are in different ways. It's always about adding to what you are already. It's not trying to do away with, so if you are of mixed parentage, of mixed racial origins, and uh, it's always about filling the gaps. It's always about you know, adding to who you are and knowing a part of you that you haven't uh, known all this while. So I think in that sense, and, and these types of quests are always, they always have to happen at the individual level. You know, it can't, it can't be, it just so happens that more people are, more African Americans, especially people in my that I have as friends are taking the test. And they're always telling me, oh, you know, and they come up to me and they tell me, you know, I'm half Nigerian, I'm half Ghana. So it's, it's happening more and more. And so it's, all, it's happening all around us, but it's still happening at the individual level. I don't think, you know, African Americans are organizing, you know, in church groups and going, no, they're not doing that. So I think 
as an individual, you still have to, you know, if that means, it means a lot to you to find out who you are, if you are mixed, if you have multiple components, we all are mixed anyway, we all have different components, we are all complex beings. And, but, but if you have this need and this appetite for knowledge about an aspect of yourself, and that aspect leads to Africa, then by all means, you know, you want to resolve that, right? You want to resolve that. And then once you resolve it, then, but I often, I often tell people that is just the beginning. The DNA ancestral result is just the beginning because then that sends you on the path to know more, to explore more, right? And to engage more. And part of the engagement is coming up with your own way of understanding that connection, your own way of making sense of it. Because identitarian claims or claims of uh, belonging or claims of uh, selfhood can only make sense to the person doing it. You can't expect these frames, for instance, that I presented to all somehow translate to your life or, be, or resonate with your life. So it has to be a personal quest that comes from you. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Chan. What, what a lecture. Quite engaging. A lot to reflect on. And, and I want to um, add that the African Union has uh, created the sixth region of Africa, which is specifically for the diaspora. And, and although there have been dissenting voices as to who would be part of that diaspora, that sixth region of Africa, whether those in the Caribbean uh, or will be part of it. But there are some state governments in the Caribbean that have bought into that. So we look forward, there, there, there is hope. And I also want to add that there are some cultural groups and um, church, especially Pentecostal churches, that are organizing uh, transnational communication and exchanges, uh, bringing African-American and Africans in the diaspora to different parts of Africa and also inviting them. That's another way. So as our lecturer informed us today, there are various ways and levels to perceive Africa or invent or reinvent Africa. It depends on individual perception and need. So I want to thank you so much uh, uh, once more, Dr. Chan. And I want to thank all of you for having the patience to stay <laughs> in spite of your busy schedules. And uh, I wish you all the best. And uh, at this juncture, I don't think anybody has a copy of uh, Dr. Chano's book that has not been autographed. If you do have a copy, please uh, uh, come along here so that you can do that. But uh, with this, I declare this uh, event closed. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs>